Good evening, everypony, and welcome to Commentary is Magic's stream on tonight, Sunday, May 13th, 2018. I am, as always, Grandpa's. I'm Emperor Bugle. Big cheese. Arquette, and surprised that Grandpa's didn't flub the intro. It's a miracle. It only took me three weeks to get it right. After having done this for almost three years. And making sure. a bet that you're like, bets on whether or not I'm going to flub the intro, and I'm like, no. I'm I'm sure you will uh, not disappoint us in the outro. Oh no, I'm I'm sure I will get completely tongue tied. I got all the blah blah blahs out in advance. I need to do that more often. Anyway, we're very glad to have everyone here. Uh, we've got a fun stream tonight. Uh, but before we actually get into that stream, Everfreeze in a week. Sweet Celestia, it's in less than a week. Oh, it is in less than uh, a week. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's in five days. Does that mean I have to get my decks ready? No. Yes. Yes. Don't, don't get them ready until the last second. I mean, that's fair. You can build a deck 20 minutes before the start of a tournament. Yeah. As long as you bring the cards for it. Or so, can. Just bring your entire collection. Yep. That's what you get good. to do when you're local. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not bringing this giant pile of stuff. It's ways way too much. Everfree is going to be a great time, though. Sim is very excited to be there running events. We're going to have all kinds of tournaments, both constructed and limited. Many of them are going to be uh, broadcast live on our Twitch channel, and some of those are going to be uh, commentated live by our very own Emperor Bugle and Living Silver. Shock and awe. Problem is, there's no, not going to be any Pen and Matt here, because that's a you and Bugle thing. Oh, Bugle might be able to get Living Silver in on it. Yeah. We'll have to see. Maybe. Oh, boy. No. It's like less than a week, though. Still freaking out. We'll have the full schedule for streaming of all of those events up uh, probably either this evening or tomorrow. By the way, speaking of <laughs> things that are going to be up this evening, Coco number five, y'all. Coco five. Because why stress about only the tournaments at the con when you could also stress about Coco? If you're stressing about Coco, you're doing it wrong. Coco is low stress. No, Coco is serious business. Got, gotta get that coveted Coco trophy. I mean, Coco fee, if you will. Bragging rights are worth a lot, right? Okay. Yeah, they are. Just hey. ask a Rainbow Dash and uh, Applejack. Uh, no spoilers. No spoilers, darling. I just meant in general. No spoilers! <laughs> For tonight, though, uh, we have a stream that's going to be talking a little bit about uh, something called opportunity costs. This oh. is opportunity uh, costs, a price to pay. Uh, someone's actually asking us about Coco in uh, chat right now. Oh, so they are. Uh, COCO stands for the Core Constructed Online Tournament. Uh, this is a tri-weekly online tournament that Sim puts on. Uh, Sign-ups are usually done through a Google Doc form, which we can link in the sidebar to you here. Um, it gives people a chance to play against other players in the Core format and allows players to use proxies of cards they may not necessarily have three copies of. Um, we usually get players from all around the world. Um, not just the U.S., but um, many uh, European Russia, countries. UK, yeah, yeah. Canada. D does UK Canada. count as a European country anymore? It still does. For the moment, yeah. It didn't change continents. We'll see about that. <laughs> it's going to be our eighth continent. Okay, sure. You you what? Be a you good chap and hold my tea. Uh, <laughs> I like. Tea. Though I, I take offense to the term tri weekly here. That doesn't seem accurate. Okay, it's eh. monthly. Anyway, yeah, it, it's, it's monthly ish. It's been going on for quite some time. So if you're curious about it, just follow the link below. Uh, sign ups for that will be due tonight at 9 p.m. Pacific. So just under two hours from now. Yep. That's Until totally then, enough time to slam a deck together. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's also enough time for a. Uh, a lecture. A lecture. A lecture. From Twilight. Lectures from... are for eggheads. From Twilight. 
we're going to start off on one of the most interesting notes with microeconomic theory. Um, to quote Rainbow Dash, so boring. So we're talking about opportunity cost. In microeconomic theory, the opportunity cost, which is also known as an alternative cost, is the value, not a benefit, of the choice of a best alternative cost when making a decision. That was a mouthful. So let's use a visual aid. You have three bits. A quill costs one bit, but a new book is three bits. And you really don't want to have the ending spoiled before you get a chance to read it. What is the opportunity cost of the book? What is the opportunity cost of a quill? Bugle, is this what, what you're doing right now? Yes. <laughs> I get the feeling this is what a number of our viewers are doing right now. Uh, I'm, I'm just waiting for uh, my owl friend to uh, walk into the room. Her hair keeps... Flushing. Like, no, well, it's flipping directions, isn't it? Oh, no, they kept it right. No, it's fine. Okay. So in that example, seriously, anyone from chat, what is the opportunity cost of a book? And what is the opportunity cost of a quill? All of your AP. <laughs> I mean, he's not wrong. I, I, I think everyone is just too enamored with, uh, with uh, Twilight. Yeah. All right, we'll, we'll, cut, him, we'll cut him some slack. It's late on a Sunday. No one's brain is functioning right now. Uh, so a choice has to be made between a few mutually exclusive alternatives, right? Assuming you only have three bits. If you assume the best choice is being made, then an opportunity cost is the cost incurred by not enjoying the benefit that would have been taken by having the second best choice. So what that really boils down to is that the opportunity cost of the book is three quills. Because with the three bits that you could buy that book with, you could buy three quills. What's the opportunity cost of one quill, All right, Cap? The opportunity cost of just one quill is the whole book. You see, the book is an explicit cost because while you have a quill and two bits, you don't have enough bits but left to buy the book too. But it's not just the whole book, it's the possibility that you could get spoiled. And the possibility of getting spoiled is an implicit cost where it isn't immediately obvious that it's also a cost. Okay, so you mentioned explicit and implicit costs. These things sound very similar, and they can be a little tricky to remember, so we're going to find a better way to remember these. Uh, implicit costs are those that can be more complex, and they aren't necessarily immediately apparent. So we're going to call those changeling costs. Explicit costs... Changeling pinky here. Yes. Explicit costs are those that are relatively simple and uh, kind of obvious, so we're going to call those tricksy costs. They aren't very tricky, though. Sorry, Hithrock. <laughs> so it's we know, okay, neither is tricksy. So we know that um, anytime you have to make a choice, not just in the MLPCCG, but where you have limited resources and one choice is deemed superior to the other, the opportunity cost is what you're giving up. It's what you could have had if you took the other choice. Some of this is very immediately apparent. If you have a set amount of money and you go out to buy one of two items, the cost of buying one is likely the other. But other times there may be costs associated that you wouldn't see off the bat. In this case, uh, having the ending of the book spoiled. Now, in the MLPCCG, we run into opportunity costs before the game even starts. Let's take a look at mains, for example. When you choose your main for your deck, some mains are going to be better than others. Like if you choose Pinkie Pie Cruise Director or Princess Cadence Loving Ruler. You chose what, would, what would we say about their choice? 
Poor choice. Per perfect choice. Yeah, that sounds about right. So what you have to consider with your main is um, what are you giving up by choosing that particular main, right? Giving up an easy flip on your main might mean having to spend card slots to ensure that you can actually get your main on their boosted side. Take the instance of Skystar versus Princess Twilight Ambassador of Friendship, right? Yeah. Skystar, in order to flip, you need two AT. That's it. That's all you'll ever need. Well, you also need two seashells. Well, you need something to represent those. I, I guess you need the main, but... Sure. That's not hard. With Ambassador of Friendship, though, you've got to find ways to put cards on top of your deck because it's not something that can just be done by basic game rules. You need cards that will let you do it. And that means that not only do you have to have those cards and play those cards, but you have to include them in your deck, which limits the amount of space you can use for cards that do other things. And then you have to find them. Yes, you do. Sometimes this is easier. Um, ancient, ancient research. research. Sure. Other times it can be much harder. You play the game for like 10 turns and you didn't get anything. Or it gets snap caked immediately. That is the worst. Uh, we go look at Everfree from, I think it was two years ago. Uh, Ponka and Feathers had that match. <laughs> Ponka kept Napcake saying uh, the owl. <laughs> so what's another uh, opportunity cost we might have before the game even starts? Another choice you might have to make? Oh, well, I mean, we just, just start, we we're talking about one, uh, starting problems. Okay, sure. So, in starting problems, you have a choice to make. Um, do you go for utility, or do you go for ease of confronting? Or do you go for Both? winter startup and get neither? Yeah. The right answer is probably not to go for winter startup. Generally, maybe. So, How about decision... a thorn in his paw? Definitely uh, not. That, no. <laughs> Going to go with no on that one. <laughs> so again, there are obvious uh, costs here, tricksy costs. If you choose to run one particular kind of starting problem, then you're not going to have access to the other. But the implicit costs can be, uh, changeling costs can be a little bit different. Uh, the lower the confront requirement for your opponent on your starting problem, the higher the risk is that did, they can DFO did, away your problem. Did, did someone say Sky Star Chicken? I I was talking you about Sky Star implying Chicken. Implying that there was implying, Sky Star Chicken. Yes. In, implying Sky Star Chicken. Hot hot wings. Always Sky Star Chicken. You we've been spoiled by Sky Star now. So that's a question that you have to ask yourself. You know, you can run a starting problem that has a very low confront requirement for you, but can your deck still get up and running if you end up going second versus Sky Star as a main? Right. This is why we don't see uh, searching high and low as frequently anymore. Unless they're running Sky Star, because you always Sky Star Chicken. <laughs> no. never, always don't Sky Star Chicken. Never don't Sky Star Chicken. Always don't. Never don't. All right, another choice that you might make, uh, another cost, opportunity cost you might face before the game even starts is colors. If you don't have access to particular colors in your deck, you can't have access to what those colors do. And yep. some effects are going to be restricted either mostly or entirely to certain colors. Uh, Bugle, give us some examples of these. Uh, well, pink is pretty well known for its uh, friend dismissal, and you mostly won't find that in other colors, aside from niche cards like uh, Rarity's Epiphany or whatever. Yep. And uh, purple's got resource banishment, which, again, you won't find anywhere else except for a petite sneeze, which is super niche. And uh, white's got discard pile removal, or not removal, uh, recursion. 
and uh, you actually won't find that anywhere else except for the uh, the shufflers. Yep, and that's not actually getting it directly into your right. hand. Yep. Uh, so generally speaking, uh, the fewer colors that you're choosing to run in your deck, the greater the consistency you'll have of a smaller variety of effects. And the more colors that you choose to run in your deck, the lower consistency you'll have of a greater variety of effects. So the question you want to ask is, do you want your deck to be able to do many different things some of the time, or one or two particular things all of the time? General guideline. Like making sure your opponent never has friends on the board Sounds by good. playing um, Burb. Constantly yeah. knowing what's in their hand by playing Tempest Hates Lyra and discarding their shinies. Or just being prepared for everything by running toolbox control. Yep. There That's are, not there a are thing. also aggro you know, options, not or, just control options, despite the things we... Our examples. Can, aggro five color options. aggro. Forget five that. Five color yeah. aggro to answer everything. Uh, no, forget that. Five color combo because you need effects from uh, all the colors. Oh, yeah. sure. Five isn't all. No, but we don't run blue. All right, what else do we have? Um, what about when we're building and we want to include uh, specific tech cards, right? Uh, these are going to be cards that are basically silver bullets. Uh, things you absolutely want to have against a matchup that would otherwise be almost impossible to beat. Uh, so this could be like running Magical Misfire against some of the combo lists that put a lot of cards in their discard pile and get them back in, like One Purpose, Vapor Trail. Or running Cracking the Case against Applejack Farming. Now, reverse those two. If you're running Magical Misfire against Applejack, it's probably not going to do a whole lot. If you're running Cracking the Case against Vapor Trail, it's, again, probably not going to do a whole lot. That's why they're silver bullets. They have one specific purpose for being in the deck. One matchup that they're there for. If you have them on that matchup, you'll do very well. Probably. So Magical Misfire's one purpose is one purpose? Yes. Yes. Obviously. How meta. That is actually kind of meta. I enjoy this. So it's something you have to think about. You might end up with silver bullets that are dead cards in all other matchups, but if it's your only way to win against the most threatening decks, maybe it's worth a card slot or two. Uh, what's On another the flip side, if your meta has zero farming, maybe you don't care as much about cracking the case. Yep. Uh, something else that can be dictated before the game even starts is the speed of your deck. Um, so we're talking about the maximum speed, uh, as fast as your deck can possibly go before you even start playing. It doesn't matter if you pack your aggro deck full of friends with gigantic power if all your friends cost 4 AT to play. You're going to be capped in terms of how fast you can go. Yeah. And kind of inversely to this, there's a general tempo curve the longer the game goes along, right? If you choose to make your deck go as fast as possible by running only one drops in your deck, you're going to have an early start. It'll be very easy for you to have an explosive early start, say turn two, turn three. But if that's all you have in hand by turn 10 or beyond, you're going to get really punished if you couldn't close the game out by then. Sounds like my turn one to me. DFO. Does kind of sound like Mosh Pit. How well does Mosh Pit do in the long, drawn-out games versus Control? Works just fine, because I get some yellow Parasprites and those eat everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that kind, of falls into, that kind of falls into our next point, right? And that's about the style of play, the archetype. Uh, your archetype, Control, Farm, Aggro, Combo, it's basically determined from the deck list alone, because without the right cards being included, there are styles of play that you just can't adopt. Um, if your aggro list, for example, isn't including any removal tools for opposing friends, you're not going to be able to control the board are, effectively if your opponent gets a hit. Are, are you trying to claim that aggro pace was not a thing? Aggro pace was totally a thing. <laughs> it, it was, was a thing. thing. <laughs> it, this one time it was a thing. The rest of the time it was a terrible idea. I, I definitely did have to aggro pace. 
Let's take a deck that many people are familiar with. Let's take Hot Wings from the Defenders of Equestria meta, right? It would have been very, very easy to remove some of the pieces that were present in Hot Wings that didn't help you score points or didn't help you rush to confront problems and just run more of those cards. But one of Hot Wings' biggest strengths was the fact that it had a variety of tools. It had speed through Night Glider and Soren, but it also had soft removal through things like Rutherford or Spitfire. It had hard removal through cards like Belly Flop for really threatening opposing friends. And you could refill your hand with cards like Gabby um, to help you last into the long game. Bro, do you even draw? So if your aggro list isn't including some variety of tools, if you just go full speed, if your opponent ever gets ahead, there's not going to be much you can do. If your Troublemaker control deck isn't running epic Troublemakers, you lose the option to farm your own TMs for that burst of points to close out a game. It's simple enough. If you don't have the cards to do what you want to do, you're not going to be able to do it. Speaking of which... Yeah, let's talk about, let's talk about what you need to do to win. This is something that goes hand-in-hand hand with archetype. Your ending goal in games is going to be mostly decided before you even sit down to play, right? Anti-social farming, farming that isn't running any friends, that has multicolor problems, can't confront to get those last few extra points. Um, combo needs some way of scoring points. Sweetie Bell is generally pretty common. Uh, Don't you have a few cases of... of I, I, I oh, do... I, oh. All right, my, I have my combo in hand. You can see it now. I, I do. Oops, I forgot to include my win condition in the deck. Don't have your <laughs> combo in the deck. I can concede yeah. it any time now. <laughs> Basically. Even, even worse is when you include one Sweetie Belle thinking you have ways to recur her, and you secretly don't. Oops. Oops. Two you, points. You, you just show Sweetie Belle to your opponent and hope they concede on the spot. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so combo has to run a win condition. Aggro has to run a win condition. And if you're not running cards to help you achieve that win condition, then it's not really an option for you. For example, if you are playing slow, grindy control, and you're not running Photo Finish or Changeling Throne, and your opponent gets ahead, well... Are we... Yeah, that that can happen. Everything is fine. So, when you're building your deck, just consider the vulnerability of certain win conditions and uh, what your backup options are going to be, if you have any, if your opponent removes access to your win conditions. So all of that we're talking about, and we haven't even started the game yet. So let's yeah. sit down and start a game. Bugle, what's the first decision you have to make? Mental ponies. <laughs> uh, first decision you have to make, since you've already chosen your main, is your starting problem. Okay, sure. Which you can decide after seeing the opponent's main. Yes, you can. So we choose our starting problem. And this can kind of help set the pace for early game. It can determine whether or not you're focused on a quick lead, or maybe setting up to build towards a mid-game position. What's the second decision we might have to make? Are the six cards that I am looking at right now good enough? Yep. Also known as the mulligan. If your hand is at least playable, are you more or less likely to get a hand that is better than the first one that you drew, right? If you have a hand that has one piece of entry into your off-color and a bunch of cards that you can play that are either multicolor or in your off-color, that's great. Unless you're up against a Tempest main. And then what do you do if they grubber you? I mean, crying's always a good option, right? Miraculously top deck the entry you needed next time. I like crying. Just saying. Crying is a pretty good option. So, something to think about. You have to consider, what are you giving up in your hand? 
are the tools that you might have access to valuable enough to where you're willing to take a risk that you might not be able to play them all exactly as you want? Yeah. Uh, another common thing is uh, you're playing purple-orange, and your opening hand doesn't have Factory Jack. But it does have a card that you know is good against the opponent's uh, specific deck style. Is that worth keeping? Maybe. AT generation is really strong, but what are the odds you're going to see that other card when you need it? Right. Especially if it's like a one of. Notice here, we haven't even really started talking about how much AT it costs to play a card, because... That's a very baseline, that's a very tricksy cost. You can look at the numbers that are there on cards and figure out exactly what you have access to. What we're really trying to look at here is, if you choose to play this card, if you choose to run this card, what is it costing you in terms of what you're having access to? Uh, now, there are four main common decisions that you're going to see over the course of the game. Most common decision is going to be, do you play something or draw something now, or do you save it or save your AT for later? And often the immediate line of play is going to be less impactful in the long term. So you have to ask yourself, is the current need for advancing your board position, you know, getting friends in play, blocking off problems with troublemakers, getting that desert road or spooky ruins into play, is that need to do that great enough that you're willing to maybe give up some of your options for later in the game? <laughs> Apple Bloom has a very strong opinion about this. Apple Bloom? Yep. So you gotta ask, do you have to play this card now? Do you have to play anything now? Do you need to have that card, or do you need to have that AT later, either one turn from now or five turns from now? Do you need to use that AT to stop the opponent from confronting? Yep. Yeah. But basically... The uh, easy way to think of this is the more things you do now, the fewer things you can do later. Yeah. All right, common decision number two. Confronting or starting a face-off, either single or double. You do it now, or do you do it later? Bugle, what are some possible opportunity costs of not starting the face-off now? Um, well, of not starting the face-off? Correct. If you choose not to start the face-off or not to confront, what are you giving? What are some situations where you might be giving something up? Well, uh, if there was, if they were going to uh, challenge a troublemaker that's about to flip, for example, uh, an epic farm deck or just a troublemaker you played, uh, by not starting the face-off, they have the opportunity to challenge that. Uh, you are not going to be removing a frustrating opposing problem, such as blackmail or even just trading traditions. Uh, you're not forcing the opponent to deal with many friends in excess of home limit. And uh, you're not setting the opponent back from starting a DFO of their own from an advantageous position. Sure. If you leave your opponent's friends and characters there at problems, they might be able to capitalize on that more than you can. Yeah, it is much easier to start a DFO if you already have characters out of problem. Uh, Cheese, what are some possible costs if you do choose to start the DFO or start the confront or single face-off? If you do start it... Well, everything goes home. Uh, you lose. Um, and losing tools you could use later. 
Sure. If you're having to spend cards in order to confront either yeah. friends or events. Yeah. Maybe you have your own problem that you like. Maybe you're on your own trading traditions. Or, yeah, if you're on um, uh, blackmail, <laughs> you start a, a face off there. It sounds like a bad idea. Probably shouldn't be doing that. But you Unless it wouldn't be the game, but... So let's take a look at a very specific example here, okay? Let's take a look at a, at a hypothetical board state. So we're playing against Applejack. And Applejack is at a problem with an apples? epic troublemaker. Buy some apples? Buy some apples. If he's already at plus four. Yep. Yeah. She is favored to win. Now we've got enough power at entrance exam to confront it. And we've got a moon dancer at a dilemma. Moondancer is currently not confronting, but we could be confronting if we used Selena Blue. Either moving her or activating her. Sure. Although this is AJ, so you'd probably prefer the plus four instead of the plus two. Probably. And that's also free. So, ah. True. And it lets you set your flip. All of those These seem... all sound good. Yeah. These do all sound good. Yeah. Opportunity cost right there. Yeah, if we choose not to do that, there's a lot of advantages we have in this situation. But orange is not without its own tricks. Most of our power is going to be concentrated onto Moon Dancer. And AJ flips an extra card during faceoffs because of her dilemma. If AJ has access to a card like Bailout and could potentially hit our Moon Dancer or just flip an additional card with something like Barrel Through, or just has a much higher flip average than we do, which she does, we might be removing our access to Entrance Exam, and we might be giving AJ two extra bonus points, making it so basically we kept it with Trixie being there. And now our stuff is all at home. Although AJ's at home too. You know what would so, be a great play here? What would be a great um, play here? Twilight and Pinky. Uh, problem bait reset. Switch. Yeah, bait and switch. That would be very good. But we don't have it. Okay, common decision number three. Your opponent has a troublemaker in play. Or you have a troublemaker, and you want to beat it up. Do you challenge it now? With the limited resources you have? Or do you wait and challenge it later and not be able to confront? Can you win the face-off? Yeah, you know, that depends. I mean, some of those costs are going to be apparent. They're going to be Trixie costs. So if you're challenging when you're down on power, it's probably going to cost you 2 AT and a point if you aren't confronting at the end of the turn. So that cost is pretty obvious. But... Others are less so. Let's say you challenge, and you're just slightly down in power after the flip, but you've got an event in hand like, oh, Ever Vigilant. It's a good event. Sure. It's pretty good have. Event. Now, you could play that event right now, and that could maybe help you win the Troublemaker face-off, but what if it means that it screws up your ability to DFO later in the turn? Or what if the opponent still has action tokens saved up and they're running, say, Princess orange. Twilight, Professor Sparkle? Or maybe they're just orange. Or maybe they're just orange and their flip average is through the roof. You um, got a Troublemaker of Vester you could play instead? A, um, I don't know. Cracking the case? Cracking the case, bait and switch. Daring do a four request tree. Yeah, something to just beat it down the old fashioned way. No. Those are all very explicit goss. Uh, yep, so those... Implicit costs here, though, are much more subtle. So from challenging now, you'll lose whatever is on top of your deck. And 
you might also open the way to your opponent confronting. So for example, if you are at control and you're set up behind your own villain and for whatever reason you know that you have a paper twilight on top of your deck, even though you could probably take the villain out, do you really want to lose that paper twilight? Do you really want to let your opponent have the chance to confront and start a f single face-off, perhaps? Those are Maybe. less obvious costs. But they're things that good players will consider before they take an action. Many times the game is going to present you with a wide variety of actions that you can take in any given situation, of which many of them are going to be far more costly than they first appear. You have to consider not just what you might be able to do, but what your opponent might be able to do in response, and what you might be giving up in order to take those actions. There's one more common decision that is made in games frequently. And that's removing a minor threat, or saving your removal for something scarier that might be coming down the line. You're playing against Tempest, starting with Trading Traditions, and naming Orange. And they and play turn one factory track. Because of course they do. It could be worse. It could be worse. They could have. I don't or... know. Uh, Factory Jack's kind of a threat. Factory Jack's good. AT generation is very, very strong. Yeah. You have a belly flop in hand and you can get into pink. That's a tempting target to get rid of. But you've also seen some of the stuff your opponent has done in the past, and you might expect some bigger threats to come down later. Something like. Princess Luna. Midnight, yeah. She's very scary. She is very scary. Lowrider, for the sake of argument, you had two belly flops. It's fine. One of them is gone, and the other one is still in your hand. So, is it worth using that belly flop now to deny your opponent a little bit of AT? Or... Should you save it in the event that a larger threat is coming, without knowing whether or not it is? And that can be a really ugly choice sometimes. The potential value of Applejack is just getting more and greater and better as the game goes on, because every turn that's another action token. And that adds up real quick. Yes, but if Luna hits the field, that adds up even faster. Although it's a deficit on your part rather than an excess on right. your part. Sure. Because Luna is very shouty and also doesn't like people moving. Some of the costs of not removing that threat immediately is it's going to stick around for a while. So in this case, AJ generates a bunch of AT for our opponent. Or let's say it's just entry, for example, if we get rid of trading traditions and factory jack is still there. If we're still saving that belly flop, maybe that factory jack is the only thing that's allowing them to play any kind of orange cards. That might give them access to other important tools in their deck. No color for you. Uh, that's that's tilting the scales a lot towards use it. Gonna be honest. On the other hand, maybe they already have uh, another orange friend in play. That's less scary than Factory Jack. And maybe they've already fixed into their white too, so you know that Luna could be slamming down next turn. Yeah, the most obvious cost you'll have of playing that removal now is you're not going to have that card later. This means not only might you not be able to answer bigger threats, but there might be a crucial moment when you want to answer that threat instead. Maybe New Luna doesn't come down, but maybe Factory Jack is the extra two power at Stubborn they need to confront and start a DFO. Swinging the needle back towards use it. All things to weigh. Uh, another, another thing to consider is how much removal do you have? Is it only three belly flops in your entire deck? Or do you happen to have like nine, nine hard removal pieces? 
Are you running DJ Pony Breakdown? The answer should be yes. <laughs> the answer is not always yes. Answer is not always yes. But if we look at the opportunity costs of including oh, DJ Pony boy. Breakdown. <laughs> well, the opportunity cost there is you want to be running Steady Session, and the explicit cost there is, well, now your deck's Harmony. That's fair. <laughs> now you get disqualified from the turn of it. Harmony is indeed an explicit cost. Would explain all the uh, all the explicitness uh, last year's GenCon. What you're playing that card? Yeah, rabble, 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 rabble. All right, that was a lot of info to go over. Uh, so let's take any questions chat might have about this. Chat, do you have any questions about opportunity costs in this game? Uh, times you may have had to make a difficult choice like that. Yeah. Sh show of hands, how many of you were rainbow at the beginning of the video? I was rainbow at the beginning of the video. I was Twilight at the beginning of the video. You were Twilight. You're Twilight most of the time. I'm Pancake. No, Pancake is Pancake. You're Cheese. Oh yeah, we do have Pancake. We do. Not that going to sleep yeah. on a pile of baked goods isn't. But I guess this is just how confusing this is, our own uh, commentators have forgotten who they are. Well, I mean, last week we had a changeling in here. That's true. Changelings he did... this time, too. What? There are no changelings in here right now. Mm -hmm. He did just kind of spring up out of nowhere. Changeling costs. Tee -hee. Well, it looks like the information here has either been well received or gone yeah, we, completely. We put everyone to sleep. Yeah, one of the two. But I would encourage players if you're finding yourself wondering why your deck might not be performing quite as well, or why you can't seem to win against certain matchups, or just why you're having a hard time getting the results that you want in general, I would encourage you to consider each decision you make a little bit more thoroughly. Maybe pause slightly before your decisions. Take a look at the grand scheme of things. I see what you did there. Maybe make a subtle plug about yourself. So, so subtle. So subtle. That, the the that is a good example of a Trixie cost. That was pretty explicit. Whereas the thing earlier about changelings. Okay, fine. Well, that was pretty explicit, too. I mean, you are hissing most of the time. Only in person. Only when people mention the traitor to the... Don't, don't, don't you do it. You're going to do it, aren't you? Uh, so Goddess Rarity says that they constantly run into the tough choice of challenging a troublemaker when they're down on power or to wait. And that is one of those situations that feels terrible to do the right thing a lot of the time. That troublemaker is blocking you from scoring points. It might not be blocking your opponent from scoring points. It might be giving a very uh, frustrating effect to deal with, like Changeling Mimics. You want that thing gone as fast as possible. But if you're down on power, if you think your opponent's going to be able to protect that troublemaker, or just has a higher flip average, or you're just especially unlucky, Paper Twilight's on top of your deck. Every time. <laughs> I'm not even running her! Judge! My opponent's running a card that's not in their deck list. If you're in that situation, then you may end up paying far more in the long game by choosing to challenge early when you are at some kind of disadvantage or aren't at a clear advantage. Mm -hmm. That being said, there are some times where it's worth it. Um, when you have nothing to lose, for example, you're at against an R Mosby, so your friend is going to go home anyway. I believe you mean an Aoi Zodal. Uh, yes, Aoi Zodal, my mistake. 
Or uh, when one of your friends there is an ember. Sure, yeah. Or your main is Rainbow, Rainbow Ambassador, and you can just move back for free. Or your main is an unflipped Applejack, and you just need her to flip. Well, I'm actually flip going to... Things. I'm actually going to harp on that uh, Rainbow example real quick here. Because that has an implicit cost, which is Rainbow is not at the problem and available to participate in a problem face-off should your opponent do so. She will be exhausted. Sure. That's true. Well, Goddess, I'm glad that this stream might help you uh, retool some of your decks. That's our goal, is just to try to help players out of any skill level. Yep. These are things that all of us still have to consider, and many times might forget. Uh, mistakes have been made in the past, and they will be made again in the future. The more uh, boneheaded they are, the better, obviously. Mistakes like building a janky combo deck and forgetting to include your win condition. <laughs> Oops. I need to get rid of that uh, pile of presents with my mare mare. I could play an event to do that. <laughs> Back on that. Opportunity cost if I play. Uh, let's play get card this party started. And, yeah, let's get this party started. Is uh, I lose the game. Hmm. Seems I, worth. I mean, you gyro for party, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. Always gyro for party. Always gyro for party. Best decision ever. <laughs> and as for me. I never don't Sky Star Chicken. I don't think I've ever play, seen you play Sky Star Chicken. I have. I have. That's the one time he appeared on stream, that's he because, didn't play Sky Star Chicken. That's because a lot of you are sitting there going, no, I know you're going to do it, so you run something that doesn't let me Sky Star Chicken. And then I'm like, I hate Fine. You. Fine. I, I've seen you put in the, the two power problem even though you know I only have trading traditions. Hey, that two problem problem was totally worth it in your matchup at Babscon. Ironically enough... Very there... sad. Okay, so here, you want to play with another opportunity cost? The opportunity cost of not opening with searching high and low is that it'll come up later in the game. Yes. And that's a little bit less nice than having concerning cutie mark come up later in the game. It's twice as bad or half as easy for your opponent to confront two power is nothing and so that's actually one of those considerations that i make when i'm messing around with sky star chicken is yeah i'm pretty sure he's going to open with trading traditions i'm still not going to run concerning cutie mark because i don't want searching high and low to come up later And you know, one other uh, example of when you have to make difficult decisions for deck building is when new cards are being added to the pool, such as when new sets are released and you go back to retool an old favorite. What gets cut? Does anything get cut? Does can the deck, cut? Yeah. Can the deck even still work in the new meta? <laughs> is there a, new, a better new main? Yeah. And we're going to have time to figure that out here sooner rather than later, thanks to Enterplay's announcement earlier this week that Set 10 is on its way. Set 10, you say? Set 10, I do say, get set, hype. Set 10 was mentioned. On, uh, on 10 the Radio Silence tweets, again. Or... On, on the Facebooks. On the Facebook. Yes. On the interfaces. Okay. On, the, on the interfaces. On the two books. The my books. The, uh, we're just going down the list of dumb crap from XKCD, aren't we? Yes. The, the face spaces. Oh my the, God. I like that one. The that's, face spaces. That's a good one. Space faces. What is, what is base from? Space, space is my space. My space. No, you said base. No. Face spaces. Oh, face spaces. Okay. No, I'm pretty sure we're just off on a tangent here. Yep. I think 
that that the will about cover. The opportunity cost of going off on a tangent <laughs> is, that... is that viewers go find something else to do. <laughs> and yeah. So that will about wrap up our discussion on opportunity costs for today. Um, we would like to give a big shout out to all of our patrons on Patreon. Thank you so much for your regular support. And if you aren't currently a patron, but you enjoy what we do, please consider donating because doing so will give you some awesome rewards, like the ability to vote on polls to determine what future videos we produce. We need a, chance like a to new one of those. Hmm? We need a new poll. We do need a new poll. Uh, you get a chance to share your own deck creations to be reviewed live, and you can even challenge members of Sim or other patrons to feature duels. If you have comments or questions you want to send our way, or you just want to say hi or hear what we're working on for the future, there are lots of ways you can stay in contact. We have our Patreon, as mentioned previously, but we also have a Facebook page at facebook.com slash commentariosmagic. I'm sorry, a Face Spaces page. Face Spaces guy. We're on Twitter at CIM underscore CCG. You can email us at commentariosmagicteam at gmail.com and patrons at or above the $5 per month level get access to our Slack channel where you can chat with us live any day, any time. Ara, how late were you up last night? I don't remember what the number on the clock was. The sun was coming up. Yeah, was basically. Was it a single digit or a double digit? I Why don't were you remember. Up so late? Because I broke everything. Oh, yeah. I remember. I went to sleep when you were fixing yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So, someone's always going to be around. If you're looking to watch any of our previous videos, including tournament recordings, such as those from Everfree or BabsCon, hint, hint, you can find oh. them on our YouTube channel linked in the sidebar. And please make sure to subscribe so we can fix our channel URL and make it a little easier to remember. We're up to 62, I think. We need 100. Please help. There's almost no opportunity cost to subscribing. The opportunity cost is the couple of seconds it took you to click a button. That's right. With all that said, we want to thank each and every one of our viewers, both here now and watching this recording later. We are Commentary as Magic. I am, as always, Grand Paws. I am Emperor Bugle. Big Cheese. And I'm Three Resource Dismissal is Mandatory. And we'll see you this weekend for Everfree Northwest 2018 tournament streams and live commentary. Or possibly at Everfree. Well, I'll see you all. You guys will all be there on site. Yeah, that's true. Take care, everyone. Goodbye. Night.